Today's episode of Nerd Soup is sponsored by NordVPN. Start protecting your internet experience today with 77% off a three-year plan by using code NerdSoup at www.nordvpn.com slash nerdsoup. Now, if you're familiar with our previous videos, you've probably heard us talk about NordVPN in the past, and it's a product that I'm excited to share with you guys because I'm a customer. I've been using NordVPN for over a year. When I'm online, I don't want my private information to be up for grabs, especially in today's day and age when you have hackers that are just lurking trying to take your information. You have government officials that can't even protect their data. The internet is like the wild, wild west. Just because you can't physically see somebody there doesn't mean that your information isn't at risk. So having a secure and reliable Reliable VPN is very important to me, and if you feel the same way, you should definitely check out NordVPN. It's one of the most highly touted VPNs in the world. It's the only VPN to get a perfect score from PC Mag, and for good reason. NordVPN allows you to access an online private network so that you can share information remotely through public networks. NordVPN uses military-grade encryption to secure your data while connected to the internet. So things like your IP address, banking information, private passwords to your social media accounts, they will all be secure and safe. They also have Android and iOS apps so that you can secure your phone while you're browsing the internet out in public. And when you sign up for NordVPN, you can have six simultaneous connections. You can secure your data on your computer, your laptop, your phone, your tablet, and you still have two more devices left over. So consider protecting your internet experience today with 77% off a three-year plan by using code NerdSoup at www.nordvpn.com nerdsoup. Game of Thrones Season 3, Episode 1. Can't believe we made it this far already. Season 3, often considered one of the best seasons of Game of Thrones, if not the best. And this opening episode... Insert title here. I don't remember the title. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think you could have come in and say it and act all smug because you, it's Velar de, de Harris. That's what I figured. I was going to say Velar Magulis, but that was last episode. All Men Must Serve. Ooh. And remember the title. Yep. Yeah, let's get right into it. Great season. And it, the cliffhanger, like we said in our last review, it's a continuation of the final scene of season two. And it's a great opening sequence for this season. Even though they don't get into the White Walker stuff too much, we're getting a glimpse of it, and it's a very in- exciting moment. Oh, it's such a great way to open the season, especially adding on to that last scene from last season. It's a really great sequence. It's terrifying. It's eerie. You can't really see. It's dark. It's snowing. Kind of what, like, uh, Beyond the Wall should have been. <laughs> no one's talking. Very little dialogue. You're focusing around the surrounding danger, and it builds a suspense. And then it finally breaks up when Sam runs in. Well, Ghost, actually, comes and saves the day. He's been waiting for this moment. <laughs> he ran away from John. Like, Yo, John, I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> I got some shit to do over here. And in this, all this chaos, Sam forgets to do the one job he's supposed to do and Moimont lets him have it. It just shows the state that they're in, just the pure chaos and the terror that the White Walkers bring. And you can't forget about the man who got his head chopped off and he's still holding it. Mm. R.I.P. to that guy. Yeah. Yeah, but this is what Beyond the Wall should have been, like you said, very little dialogue, more about, should have been more atmospheric, more tension. Beyond the Wall just, it lacked weight and uh, you can make the argument that this five minute cold opening has more weight than that entire 60 minute episode <laughs> um yeah but it's a great opening and like you said we see ghosts we see mormont who's probably more terrifying in this moment to sam than the white walkers were oh uh, yeah probably did you do your job your one job that we gave you i didn't <laughs> sorry mort sorry mormy <laughs> and going even farther north of the wall we have John entering Mance Raider's camp. Another great introduction, too, to the way of life of the Wildlings. And this is, I've always enjoyed John's time with the Wildlings because it's a new perspective on what society could be in Westeros. And I always make the, there's a debate to be had, who's more progressive, the Wildlings or Dorne? You would think that those are the two most progressive societies. I think I would lean towards the Wildlings, mostly because they're just democratic. Yeah, but, I mean, John Reffin's like, oh, once I join you, are you uh, am I free to go? He's like, yeah, and I'll be free to hunt you down. And That's freedom. Uh, not really. The freedom to run and the freedom yeah, to ca- hunt. It's chaos, though. Yeah, that that's, type of well, it's anarchy. Yeah. Chaos is a ladder. Well, oh, shut up. Great line, though. You know the thing about chaos. Yeah. It's fair. 
All right. Can we stop? We'll get to that episode eventually. Just please. Do any of us have free will? Now you're going Westworld. We're only 10,427 lines of code built to survive. That's it? Not to change. Uh, but yeah, you see John just taking it all in. First, the Giants. Yeah. Good CGI. The yeah. They look great. They do. It's Getting kinda... in shape, working out, <laughs> pounding men into the, to the ground. They're shy I creatures. think she's, she's overrating them a little bit. I'm pretty sure they would just splat and flatten out. I don't think they would go into the ground, especially up well, north. it's cold up north. Yeah, it's really cold. There's no yeah. way they're doing that. They shatter. Yes. Which <laughs> no. I think that would have actually been more impressive. Yeah. If they were just shattering their frozen bones. Mm. And all the wildlings just hate John. He's not very popular. Yeah, let him live. He's about to join you guys. You don't want to make a bad first impression. Well, the introduction, too, that he has with Tormund, where he thinks that Tormund is the king first. <laughs> yeah. And Tormund's loving it. He gets down on his one knee. The back and forth between John and Tormund, where John says that my father taught me that big men fall just as fast if you hit them in the heart. Tormund has the line. It's like a lot of little men like you tried to stab, the, stab me in the heart, and there's a lot of little skeletons buried in the ground. And Tormund became one of the fan favorites. And this must have been cool for book readers because I'm sure he's great in the books as well. He's very different, though, in the first introduction. He's more of that He's guy. funny. Yeah, he's more lighthearted in the later seasons, especially with his whole dynamic with Brienne. But I remember the first season, he's with John. He's kind of a, he's more of the tough. Once we get to know him more in the show, he kind of lightens up a little. I do like that, that they gave him the tough exterior and it kind of fades. Because even in these scenes, you could see that he's a bit tongue-in-cheek. He likes to have a good time. I was just waiting for a nice, Arr! We never got that. Or the bear. Oh, well, I guess not. They're never going to show that bear scene. Oh, no. It's not in the books either. But an, an introduction to another character, Mance Raider, who, while I love what they did with Tormund in the show, Mance Raider left a little bit more to be desired. I think they could have focused on him more, and especially in this scene, the interaction that they have in the book, because hey, when Mance Raider gives him the story about how he traveled south of the wall and he was at King Robert's feast at Winterfell, it gives John a more realistic explanation as to why he would want to join the Wildlings. He gives him more characterization, you know, he's playing his, I forgot what instrument he plays gonna piss me off now he's playing an instrument you know you don't, you don't have his you don't have val you don't have his daughter it's just kind of just an old ex crow that went up north and now he's king a little bit more than that yeah but for the most part like, uh, for the introduction but i like when he, he's talking to john and he's like asking him why he wanted to join the wildlings and at first he says that he wants to be free and he's really not buying that then he goes into detail Well, what man says is completely accurate but because at this point in the show john is still trying to just be a hero and that's what he wanted to be. They stress that a lot in the books, that he's always imagining himself leading an army, raising castles, and being a hero. And as the show goes on, he realizes, this hero shit is not for me, dog. <laughs> so Mance Raider was right on the money with this. Yeah, but then you hear John go into more, I think there's some truth to this as well, when he's talking about how he saw what uh, Mormont was doing, and he saw the White Walkers, and he didn't care what Crasher was doing. And truth I in his fear, maybe. Yeah. But I think he's got to understand what Mormont was doing. But it was still a little contentious at that moment, too, yeah. with them. So. Do, do you buy it from what? Mance Raider's perspective? It's kind of like... The book well, version is just so welcome, much better. Welcome to the club now, John. Because in the book, he says, you were at the feast with King Robert. Did you see where I was sitting? I was sitting at the back of the hall. I was never accepted by them. them. Here I can be free. I can be one of you. And it's similar to the reason that he joins the Night's Watch. I guess almost the Wildlings is a step further. So like I said, they are a democratic society. They treat their men and women equally. But like you said, it also is a little, it's kind of anarchy. Yeah, but this one was kind of like, oh, John needs to join the Wildlings for his next part of the story. And we'll just let him in our club. Yeah. And this is a funny scene with um, Braun kind of just enjoying his time at Littlefinger's brothel. And Podrick comes in and interrupts him. <laughs> We've all been there when, you know. Oh, that old, yeah. That old thing when you're trying to. When, you're, when your uh, boss's squire comes in and interrupts you at a brothel. Yep. No, I was talking from Podrick. When oh. you go, yeah, you have to interrupt one of your other uh. bosses, I guess. <laughs> Some Podricks, yeah. <laughs> Not the Braun thing. No, 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 no. And this scene with Cersei. It kind of reminds me of some of the scenes that they've had in season two, where you think Cersei may pity. Tyrion a little bit but it just makes me feel bad for Tyrion because he's been backed into a corner and the joke that Cersei makes where she says you don't need a lot of space and Tyrion says well Pycelle just made the same joke you freaking idiot she's so, kind of like she's loving this she's antagonizing him. she has like a half-hearted smile on the whole time like she's not really she likes to see Tyrion in this moment and Tyrion well I love when she brags about her spy network too so like, I have hundreds of spies under my employment dad told me <laughs> how many cups of wine do you think she had oh she was lit she was, she was definitely <laughs> And when they talk about his killer, 
he says that it wasn't one of Stannis' men, it was Sir Mandon. And she says, hmm, that's very interesting. Yeah. So they kind of leave it open-ended here that we don't know who sent the killer. And it would make sense why Tyrion would be afraid of Cersei. Yeah, well, he obviously thinks it's Cersei, and he might be worried about Cersei, but Cersei's also worrying about why Tyrion wants to meet with Tywin. The whole time she seems to keep asking him about that meeting, so she might think, I don't know, Tyrion's probably scheming up something and later yeah, on he's we scheming s- up trying to get the fuck out of there yeah okay. so maybe you should have helped him with his schemes you idiot yeah she probably doesn't want him to get castle rock either yeah why for no reason right because because she just hates him irrationally as does tywin Braun outside sizing up Marin trent he always goes to that move the behind the back knife grab yeah and i think they all think he's just scratching his back like this idiot i'm gonna kill him <laughs> but he never really gets to use it i like what he says to Marin trent he says you would probably wouldn't fare as well in a fight against a man rather than beating on innocent girls and Braun, even though in season two Tyrion says if I ask you to kill a baby would you do it he'd say no I wouldn't do it without question I'd ask you how much Braun does have a moral code as much as Braun could have he's not a character that's just going out of his way to torture people or murder people he's he's morally flexible yeah but you could tell right away he doesn't like somebody like Marin Trant they're not going out for drinks no the hound maybe you can sit down he can have a beer with the hound and then Braun, if they did go out to drinks he would have more money because he wants a raise apparently from Tyrion. <laughs> he wants to be paid double. He's a knight. It makes sense. Yeah. Fair is fair. Come on. And even Tyrion says, I thought we were friends. He's, yeah, we're friends, but I don't lend out my services to friends. It's like the scene in Curb Your Enthusiasm when Larry David's trying to get the doctor to check out his back. And the doctor's like, what do you do? He's like, I'm a writer. It's like, all right, next time you're in a big rush, why don't you write me a bunch of shit for free? <laughs> so that's what Braun is saying here. I don't, this doesn't come free, boy. I like you. We're funny. We're a great pair. We have great chemistry. People love us. And the thing is, Tyrion, you know, he's loaded. Oh, yeah, it's like, oh, what am I paying you now? It's like, well, you have to ask, then it doesn't really matter, right? <laughs> yeah, and we get the revelation in this episode that Davos is alive. He awakens on a small little island, and this scene always makes me thirsty because he looks very parched. I know in the books, he's looking like the bottom of rocks to get some moisture. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, that's rough. Uh, you know how much he would have killed for a blue power raid in this scene? <laughs> From McDonald's? Just, oh, they don't do them anymore. <laughs> It is, it is. It's tragic. No, they don't do plastic. Really? Not, not at sunrise. No. I don't know. You guys have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> and this is, I love this too, because especially in the Night of the Seven Kingdom, when it's the aftermath of the first Blackfire Rebellion, and it was very dangerous to say in public who, which side you fought on. Did you fight for the Blackfires or the Targaryens? And even in this time, during the War of the Five Kings, it's very dangerous because if you say the wrong king, they'll kill you. And I love the way he says it with confidence. He says, you know what? If I'm going out, I'm going out. He says, I fought for the one true motherfucking king, bitch. Stannis. They might have been on the other side, and they just, like, respected him. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I would have been like, uh, Stan Jirafrov. The king who won. Yeah. Who, uh, who, 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 are you, who do you guys serve? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I serve God. Oh, all right. Oh, this guy. Yeah, <laughs> just God. leave him on the island. Yeah. <laughs> right, nothing to see here. <laughs> and Saladar Son, it's co- almost like Tyrion and Braun. It's a similar conversation where Saladar is not willing to help Davos, even though, though they are close friends. Apparently, Davos has been to four of his weddings. You drank with me at my wedding, and you drank with me at four of mine. <laughs> yeah. He's a pimp. Davos is not going to give up. He's anxious to get back to Stannis. He wants to and he's hearing the stories here. Melisandre, yeah. And she's, she sounds so much more evil than she actually is. When you hear the stories from other people that she's building a great fire, she's burning everybody that she con- t- considers a heretic, all the people that are following the wrong gods, and you can see Davos just still doesn't give up on Stannis. And you said it last season that it's a very weird relationship. Just go back to smuggling something. It's just, you have a wife. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does have a wife. People forget that. And his other sons. Well, now in the book and show, he only has one. Imagine like... Rip Mathis. Uh, I don't want to judge, but how shitty does your wife have to be for you to choose Stannis? It's like, oh, you're so, you're awful. I don't hang out with you. I'm going to go hang out with Stannis for the rest of my fucking be life. Be careful, man. There are a lot of Stannis <laughs> fans out there. But uh, show Stannis. And how horrifying is this scene with at Harrenhal? It's, it's horrifying in a way because Rob, you can feel the weight of the world starting to crumble on his shoulders. Because the circumstances of the war throughout season two, they were going pretty well up until the end. And now it's the situation where he has to try and get his castle back. He's going to Harrenhal. He's getting ready for a siege. Little does he know, all these motherfuckers are gone, and the Northmen are dead. They're dead. And you could see that Karstark and Bolton, this is when they're beginning to question his leadership. The main focus is on them, but even when he steps in and he looks around at all the bodies and he looks at all of his men on the battlements, and they're all looking at him to see what he's going to do with Catelyn. Find her a room that will serve as a cell. Hanger. Oh, jeez. Killer. Probably should have. 
What? Well, well you they, can't. You can't win. I feel like probably should have killed Kyburn. Well, no, he doesn't. Hey, Mister Q, how you doing over there? You want some water? Why not? He's definitely Jamie. not going to come out, come back to bite us. One yes. of my favorite scenes of all time, though, this next scene between Tyrion and Tywin. This is a scene that I go on YouTube and I just watch over and over again because Charles Dance in this scene is just every word that the man speaks. I've got seven kingdoms. Three of them are in open rebellion. Business as usual. Just fought in a fucking battle, now he's straight to work. I was like half expecting him to pick up a phone, like he's just busy, people calling him. It's like, the what, monkey not, on the typewriter. Yeah, he's like, not now, I other things to do. It's like, Mr. Lannister, you gotta call on line two. Who is it? Lord Bolton? Tell him I'll call him back. <laughs> we got we got plans later on in the season. <laughs> Valyrian steel stock down 10%. Sell, sell, sell. <laughs> what now, Tyrion? I'm busy, can't you see? I got business to attend. Yeah, but it is a great scene because we're getting more into why Tywin has this irrational hate of his son. And you know what? I kind of agree with his decision here. I wouldn't give Tyrion Castle Rock either. Why not? Because he'd get too comfortable and he would have turned it into a whorehouse. He would have got really comfortable and he would have fucked it up. It's his birthright, though. He's, I, I will hear no more of Tyrion's birthright to Castle Rock on this review. Okay? And the next whore I find you with, I'll bang. That's what he should have said. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what he did. Um, no, I agree with Tywin. Why give, why? He would have fucked it up. No, he wouldn't have. Tyrion's great in crisis. He's great when he knows he has a goal. What is, what is your goal with ruling Castle Rock? He would have just, and I can understand because Tywin's father, he just lost Castle Rock like 40, 30 years ago. Tywin had to slave to get it back. He had to go to war. He had to kill all his underlings. I can under, I can, why? You think Tyrion should have had it? It's birthright. Give it to him. Well, you think Jamie would have done any better? Jamie doesn't care about anything. Jamie would Except for Cersei. No, but Jamie never would have taken it. I think Jamie would have been better. Tywin should have done it anyway. It's a fucking joke. Oh, yeah, you can have Castle Rock. Oh, what's that in the mines? Nothing. Good luck, you fuck. <laughs> yeah, that would have been even worse. They would have been broke because Tyrion would have been partying every night. He would have turned the Castle of the Rock into Vegas and then Atlantic City by Vegas the end of the year. Vegas makes money. They got a hockey team. They got a football team. Yeah, but not Atlantic City. They're not making money. It does make me feel sad for Tyrion, what Tywin says to him. <laughs> they always have to go to the mother thing. And this is just, we've talked about it so many times, but it's one of the biggest what-if scenarios in Game of Thrones. What if Tywin Lannister treated Tyrion fairly? Not even well, because Tywin was never a great father to any of his children. He's not going to pat you on the back, give you words of encouragement. It's you need to do your job, do it well, and then move on. Work for the family. And I think Tyrion has proved that he was the most capable out of the three children, but because he was born a dwarf, because he killed his mother, it's a combination of all these things. If Tyrion was six foot two, looked like Jaime, he'd be the golden child of House Lannister. He would be Tywin's successor. He would be molding him to rule. It's a shame that they never got along because who knows where House Lannister would have been if Tyrion was still in the fold for them. Men's laws give you the right to bear my name and display my color, since I cannot prove that you are not mine. And to teach me humility, the gods have condemned me to what you waddle about, wearing that proud lion that was my father's sigil and his father's before him. But neither gods nor men will ever compel me to let you turn casterly rock into your whorehouse. Go. Now. Yeah, but then this next scene, you don't really like Sansa. No, you don't like Shay. Sorry. No, I love Sansa. What are yeah, you, doing? you love. You don't like Shay and Roz. I don't. So when this came together, this was just like the ultimate boar fest for you. Yeah, I think I passed out. Yeah. I think you could take care of this one. No, I mean <laughs> they're fine characters. I just you don't like the juxtaposition. I kind of like how Shay is. She doesn't like to acknowledge where she's been or where she comes from. She kind of likes to act like she's always been in the high class. You know what the thing is that bothers me too, and I hate saying this because I can't act worth the shit. But the actress is not really that great. Why? Why did they cast her? I don't know, but that's such. It's she's so weird. She sticks so, out. Sometimes she's not. Sometimes she's okay, but other times uh, the accent and everything it just doesn't really work for me. So I kind of get thrown out, and I'm like, oh, that's that's Shay. It's weird because they made her a better character than her book counterpart, but they casted the worst actor on the show. <laughs> but Ross is good. I like that too, where Roz is like, it, "It's look how far but we've really, come," and Shay's like, "Where, where was I? I really, you were a whore." It really goes nowhere. It's like Roz is not gonna. It does go nowhere. Yeah. So watch her with Littlefinger, and Shay doesn't do any. Has no interactions with Littlefinger. It's like, ever. oh, Roz, Roz about to give Varys some fucking some good shit right now. He's about to take out Littlefinger. No, nope. give, it, give it a draw for him. Yeah, she's just dead. And Sansa's little game with the ships, really boring. Not not the scene itself, but you can't find a better game. Yeah, they don't have like. What's that game that Tyrion and uh, Young Griff were playing? I I can spell it, but I can't read it. 
<laughs> that's my life story. It's like Westerosi chess. Yeah. And he always he always tells him like not like focus don't focus too much on the dragons and something like that. I forget. Yeah, there's a lot of hitting yeah. hidden meeting. Can't wait for Winds of Winter. And in this scene we can see that Sansa is now embracing the idea of escaping with Littlefinger before she was reluctant and Littlefinger even mentions that in this scene. Oh, I thought you didn't I thought King's Landing was your home. But Sansa's like, No, get me get me the fuck out of here and we know how that's going to end up. And in this next scene, Daenerys is sailing on her new ship, sailing to Astapor, and this is where she's going to acquire the Unsullied. And the conversations here between Jorah and Daenerys, it seems that Jorah is in favor of getting the slave army. He kind of flips on it. Yeah, he does flip. He's a flip-flopper. Um, and Daenerys is reluctant because they are slaves, and that comes back later in the episode when she's dealing with the master of the Unsullied. And I think she's, Amelia Clark is great in this episode. She gets a lot of slack about being a bad actress as well, but... Which I disagree with. Yeah, I think in especially season three and three and four, I think she does really well. Drogon, man, looking like a fruit roll up. That's just a credit to this show that they've kind of blurred the line between what it means to be a movie or a TV show. You look with the special effect, and even now, what is that? Like five years ago? Yeah, that's yeah. And he's still, I saw it watching again. I'm like, damn, you grew up fast. I think there's only one scene where it was like, okay, it's when she first rides him in season five. Uh, this looks a little goofy, but I'll forgive it. Yeah. Because I mean, it's a great scene. Davos, when he arrives at Dragonstone again, and this is, I mean, even though they butcher the arc in the end, I won't say butcher. I won't because I've been hard on Stannis and where he ends up. But He's a hard this, man. This is where it's just starting again, where it's that shared delusion that Melisandre and Stannis have, where Davos is trying to get a word with Stannis alone, and he's like, we are alone. He just can't, can't shake Melisandre. She's like his shadow. I literally see her right there. But I mean, it's kind of like Drax and Infinity War. They do have that nice moment though when Davos first comes in and Stannis is so excited to see him. It's like, oh, I thought you died. I'll come here, buddy. I love you so much. <laughs> it's like fighting back tears. Yeah. I thought you died. Yeah. Is that a tear? Stan? No, no, not a tear. It's like Davos, I miss you so much. I'm just sweating from my eye. <sighs> and then, yeah, you couldn't at least crack a smile. You fuck. No, he can't smile. He's Stannis. <laughs> I don't think he ever laughed. In the show, Tywin laughed once with Arya. Stannis never laughed. But yeah, I mean, Melisandre, where they're just having this back and forth, where Davos is saying he doesn't kill people for worshiping different gods. If he did, he would would have thrown Melisandre in the sea. And the way Melisandre speaks and the the lines that they give her in this scene is so well written because she's so scary. But she's not being loud, she's not being aggressive. She's very smooth, very charismatic. And the thing that she says about his son. That just gets Davos, where even Davos can't restrain himself from trying to kill her, even though that's what he came there to do. But it's in that moment, it, he just lets the emotions get the best of him. Yeah, and it's great, too, because how Melisandre shifts the blame to Davos. So, well, I wasn't there. I could have helped you. Uh, I don't think she's going to be there, you know, at Fire Nation, bending that shit and sending it back to uh, Tyrion. But it kind of, you know, puts that doubt in Stannis' mind. Like, hey, you told me to leave her, and, you know, she is the... Uh, the Red Priestess, she does do a lot. Of, I seen her do some shit with fire, so maybe it could have had a different outcome. But but it's it's the sign of a shrewd politician, where she knows where to shift this blame. It's such a great opportunity for her to get back into the good graces with Stannis. But it even strengthens her position now. Is it because, possible to be in good graces with Stannis? I feel uh, like you're you're either content or you're dead to him. Yeah, it's content or dead. With, look at Shireen. I don't even think he loved her. <laughs> <laughs> I guess she was kind of both. Yeah, and then Davos gets sent to this. Yeah, well. <laughs> Poor Shireen. Kid had such a future and just went up in flames. <laughs> uh, next scene, Marjorie at the orphanage. Talk about another shrewd politician. I mean, this is why I can't hate Melisandre because she's just so clever. And Marjorie, I like her. She's not as evil as Melisandre, so she's even more likable. What she's doing here with the orphanage, Joffrey can't believe it. I love when he's like looking through the little uh, cart. What's she doing over there? It's like traffic on a Tuesday. <laughs> this is unbelievable. I'm the king. <laughs> it's such a different way to manipulate. You see how uh, Melisandre uses her sexuality and uses. She knows Stannis so well. She knows how to get him to do what she wants. Whereas Marjorie, it's more larger scale for the the, the small folk because. They're the people that if they, you know, we've seen with the riots before, but if they get unsettled, then, you know, the higher ups begin to, you got to keep an eye on them. You got to keep them happy. You don't want any revolution or anything like that happening. So by coming in, bringing all the wheat and grain and whatever else from High Garden, helping ingratiating herself with the small folk of King's Landing eventually helps her because she's beloved by them and the Tyrells in general. 
You have, I mean, if you're in King's Landing, you're living in, uh, you're eating, what are they called, the brown? Yeah. <laughs> you're in the brown th- three meals a day, you know, and <sighs> all of a sudden the Tyrells come, you know, I'm going to sh- I'm gonna be Team Tyrell. Oh, Fuck yeah, the Lannisters. definitely. And it's another, it's just a great opportunity for House Tyrell and for Marjorie specifically. And it's an interesting contrast to compare Marjorie and Melisandre because I think Marjorie's way more ambitious. Melisandre's not trying to become queen. Obviously, she's found herself in a position of power. But I think it is coming from a genuinely good place where she thinks there is a threat and that she can actually help. She does have a lust for power. She does crave power. But not like Marjorie wants to be queen of the world. Yeah, She wants to rule everybody. And it's interesting you said, too, before when you were talking about she's not as evil as Melisandre. But there is a hint of, like... Oh, no, she's... Well, yeah, not, but I'm just yeah, saying that yeah. the the, uh, the concept of the only reason why you're treating you're taking care of the small folk is out of your own personal gain and not because you actually care. It's not as abrupt as burning people alive, or it's not as shocking, but it's just as effective. Yeah. Later, Marjorie continues her game with Cersei and Joffrey when they all sit down for dinner. And I think what Cersei can see right through her, because Cersei, when you've spent so much time, when you've spent basically your entire adult life in King's Landing, it's like what Maester Aemon says. You just know when people are lying or when they're disingenuous. And it begins that relationship where I wish I wish they would have leaned into this more in season six. I thought that they could have had more battles between Marjorie and Cersei. At one point, I thought that's what we were going to get, but it's great. All their scenes in season three, four, and five, the cat fights that they have, but they're so subtle. It's two masters going at it. My favorite in the books is I think Loras teaches Tommen how to joust and do everything. Cersei says to Tommen, it's like, oh, your father was won many tourneys in his life. Like, you'll be a natural or whatever or something along those lines. And Marjorie's like, oh, uh, I don't know, Robert. What, what tourney, tourney did Robert win? And she's like, oh, the tourney in the trident. Ever, ever hear of it? <laughs> <laughs> I see Cersei getting yeah. a little offended, backing up Robert. That's funny. <laughs> I love that. Like, oh, fuck, that was close. Jamie, we gotta, gotta lay low for a while. Yeah, but Cersei is, you can tell she's over it. She's yeah, seen she's, this game, but she's probably tried to play it once or twice in her day. And Joffrey's kind of like, oh, wow, these, wow, these people are pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, Joffrey's loving these people. <laughs> I love Cersei, too. She's like, yeah, the riot the other day, um, the king almost lost his head. And Joffrey's like, mom, you're always over-exaggerating. <gasps> Kill them! Kill them all! People getting fucking limbs ripped off and shit. Mom, you're embarrassing me. Things landing for you. Yeah. Now, this is great, too, because it's kind of like what Cersei's doing with Marjorie, where Daenerys, it's unknown to us and it's unknown to him that Daenerys does know Valyrian. And when she reveals that she can speak the language later in the season, it's one of the best scenes of Game of Thrones of television history. It's amazing. And But this guy is just such a dick. And I do like the fact that they aged up Masande. I think having an older Masande benefited the show. That's one of the changes that I like. Well, it gives Daenerys a... A buddy. Know, yeah, a friend, a sidekick. You know? Yeah. That's nice. They are big, too. Because <laughs> uh, Dorea clapped up here Yeah, she did. She lost her couple <laughs> yeah. of sidekicks. So. Looking back, when we know how that big reveal, when we do know she knows Valyrian, I'm, like, watching her the whole time. Just trying to see, like, yeah, she knows. She knows. She knows. When he says that Jorah smells of piss... Her face kind of shifts a little bit. It's like, eh, yeah, he's kind of right. It's crazy. I mean, yeah, it's a good selling point, though. If you want to show how tough you guys are, just cut off one of their nipples and be like, hey. Oh, I can't I can't do with that. I can, I, the, the nipple, just leave the nipple out of it. <laughs> it's, it's just such a sensitive piece of skin. Just leave it alone. It's funny, too, because even Masande is, like, caught off guard with the things he's, he's saying. She's trying to translate it in a way where she doesn't come off too rude. <laughs> And then when she says something about the nipples, she goes, uh, the wise master would like to inform you that men don't need nipples. <laughs> and it's very awkward for her. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, well, they don't need nipples. You know? It's a, like us with the appendix. We get the appendix out. We don't need it. You think that evolution would have taken care of the appendix and the nipples for men? I think there was other f- bigger fish to fry. Bigger, bigger. <laughs> okay, well, I'll have a talk with Darwin and get back to you. But the Unsullied. The way that they build them up, just this extremely formidable force, mm. just these soldiers that they don't drink for days, they don't eat for days, they've been trained since they were young, they kill off the weak ones, only one in four can make it, they have them rip babies from their mother's arms and kill the babies right in front of the mother, you would think that these guys would never, li- there's stories about how they would be hired by these great cities to hold back the Dothraki, where they could fight on the open field against the Dothraki. It, just incredible soldiers. Well, when you, when you don't realize, you got to read the fine print of the contract for the Unsullied. There's a little, you know, it's like, uh, takes you somewhere, a little article, and you got to take a microscope. You can see in small print it says, warning, do not fight Unsullied against rich people in an alley. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah. There's always a catch. Yeah. No Everything how- else. The Dothraki, no problem. We could take them. 
Uh, West Roasting Nights? Yeah. Fine. Breakfast? Yeah. Easy. Noblemen in an alley with small knives? And no. fancy masks? Yep. Uh, that you really can't see through? Probably, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, you know what it is? Because they're just fighting on instinct. It's like mm. Daredevil. Or Ooh. when Luke Skywalker closes his eyes when he's training with that little laser ball thing. Close your eyes, use the force. So they're Jedi ninjas, pretty much. Yeah, and Daenerys is still reluctant to purchase the Unsullied, but Jorah kind of makes the point that, who do you think is going to give them a better life? You or this madman who looks like Ben Kingsley in Gandhi? So that's what you need to take in, into account here. And Daenerys isn't even listening to him. She's trying to play with this little girl. She's like, ooh, a ball. They kind of do shifts. Like, doesn't Jorah say later on that how it's not wise to take the Iron Throne with slave soldiers and things like that? Yeah, he's such a piece of shit. You know who Jorah is? The guy when you order pizza and he says he won't, doesn't want to chip in, and then the pizza gets there and he's like, oh, I'll take a slice. Teddy? Yeah, he's Teddy. Okay. Got to get the obligatory Teddy reference in. Well, you always just set me up for him. I feel like if I didn't say Teddy, he would, yeah. he would get upset. It's a Teddy alley Speaking of that most respected fighter in Westeros, he's back, Sir Barrison. Sir Barrison looking like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Save of the year. That is a great save. And I'm surprised that Jorah just didn't kill him when he grabbed Daenerys. Yeah. I like. <laughs> yeah, he's a main. We'll kill him off in season five. Don't worry. She's lucky he was there. He saved her from the warlocks. And as we know, the warlocks are a continued threat throughout the rest of the series. They come back. They send even more and more at her. They don't s- They don't stop. stop. And it's, it, it's, it's when it first happened, I'd be like, it would be really weird if they just never mentioned that again. When it did happen, I was like, oh, cool, the warlocks. I remember them from season two. They're going to be a continuous thing. Yeah. And when they kept coming back, I was like, oh, I like this guy, Piat Pri with the purple lips. I thought he was dead, but there's more of them. They're all there's, coming out. Because, yeah. yeah, they just continuously create new ones, and they're just so magical and mysterious and ambiguous, and they never come back again. Yuren picks up a couple in the book, so. Yeah, he does. He's like, yo, come ride with me, boy. <laughs> Got a dragon egg that I'm going to give to the Night King, and that's how he's going to get his ice dragon. I do love the scenes going forward between Daenerys and Barrison because he gives her more history about her family history. and uh, Yeah, I mean, I do like it. I, I obviously understand why they couldn't have, you know, Arson Whitebeard. Like, who's this guy? Yeah, that would have been That we've seen in season one. It would have, yeah. It, it wouldn't play off like that. It would be a little weird. But I do like in the books how she, he's not sure. Like He's trying to find out more about Daenerys because yeah. that uh, experience we had with the last uh, Targaryen wasn't, didn't go so well. So I like how he did that and then the whole reveal and she finds out that they both betrayed him. I kind of like how that played out, but this is fine too. Like I said, it would be ridiculous if they tried to do that. So Great first episode for a season. I think this might be out of season out of the first three seasons. This is the best premiere of any season so far. It's a really good episode, too. The way they start it, too, just carrying right off the back of the season two finale and just setting up, you know, Daenerys starting to get her army together. Well, we see the threat of the White Walkers. We see we see the disdain that Tywin has for Tyrion. That's, like, the first real, like, we always heard hints of it, and but that was actual, like, that was kind of like a slap in the face. Like, whoa, this yeah. guy sucks. Yeah. And, yeah, I think it sets it up beautiful to probably, if not the best, one of the best seasons of the show. Yeah. Only eight more episodes until Rob dies. Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.